Next up, we have Peter Carvaris, who will be uh, leading a town hall. Um, he will uh, speak for a few minutes, and then uh, we're going to have an interesting conversation. All right. Can you hear me? Good. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try and talk for maybe, I just got like seven, eight slides to kind of kick things off. Um, the title of this talk was much too grand. Uh, I can't possibly talk about the future of computation. I don't know enough to say anything about that. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's increasingly hard for us in life. And, and, and other people can uh, either uh, react to that or, or talk about things that are hard for you too. Um, so uh, who am I? Why am I here? Very quickly. Uh, I kind of had a, a career that's crisscrossed back and forth between industry and academia, but now I'm with LIGO, uh, and I manage the data analysis computing uh, for LIGO at Caltech. Um, and I'm here today because um, Condor basically powers all of LIGO's science, um, all of our computing. Um, it depends on Condor. Um, LIGO and, and I, in particular, really appreciate and value this community enormously, um, not just the Condor team, but the whole, whole community around Condor. Um, and how it's enabled our science, and I love and miss Madison, and I haven't missed the Thunder Week, so I, I had to be here. Um, so what's hard? Uh, I got five things to talk about. Um, the first is uh, resource planning and scheduling is, is getting harder. Um, we have increasingly um, heterogeneous resource demands, and it's getting tricky for, for resource planning and scheduling. Uh, in LIGO, we have kind of maybe four categories of, of resources that we worry about in terms of computing. There's what we call low latency or online high throughput computing. And this is for our, this is basically when data comes off the detector and we need to figure out if there's a possible gravitational wave candidate and get it to astronomers really fast, like within a minute, so that they can turn telescopes and point and see if they can see an electromagnetic follow up. So it has to happen. This, these, these jobs have to run right away or not at all. Um, we sometimes call them real time inside LIGO, but you know, there's kind of a, a formal real time, which is much faster than a minute, and so we, that's not the right word for it. But we call it low latency or online. Um, that's one kind of, of demand we have. Another is just sort of the traditional batch and offline demand, um, which you're all well familiar with, high throughput computing. Um, then there's GPU demand, which is which I'm not going to go into any detail with it, but I want to raise it because I know there's other people in the room who, who have talked to me in the past 48 hours about you know how increasingly tricky it is to plan and, and schedule. GPUs alongside CPUs, so other people can say more about that. Um, and then there's HPC. You know, we have a sort of in LIGO, we don't have an enormous amount of demand for for jobs with a lot of um, you know uh, internode communication that require you know high performance interconnects and MPI. But we we have more and more of them, and we do have simulation and things like that. And it's starting to become something that we have to also uh, plan for and schedule. Um, and it's it's tricky to sort of balance the four of these. Um, the first thing I'll say a little bit about, because it's interesting, is how we've balanced the low latency online versus the batch offline demand. Um, uh, I was going to talk about our observing runs and how we've done it differently, and then I realized way back in 2004, um, I put together a, an unholy set of policy expressions called the blowing your batch systems, basically solved this same problem. So there's nothing new under the sun. Um, but it's never, it's always been sort of janky, the solutions to these problems. So in the first two observing runs of LIGO in 2015, and oh, these are my older slides. Oh, well, that's all right. They're good enough. Um, in 2015 to 2017, we needed to make sure that these low latency jobs would run right away. So we just dedicated some CPUs to them. You know, we took 300 cores or 400 cores and just stuck them in a separate rack and, and made sure they would only run the low latency jobs. And they were probably, you know, over the course of two years, they were probably 20% utilized, but we needed to make sure that those jobs would run. So that was our solution. But it started to bother us more and more that we had 80% of, you know, 500 cores just sitting idle most of the time. So for 03, um, we came up with this clever idea to just run basically two pools on top of the same resources um, and use C groups to make sure that the, the sort of offline batch start D that could access all the same cores as the low latency uh, jobs, would the batch jobs would, would be completely starved of CPU and IO if the low latency jobs were running. Um, and the low latency jobs would, would would get anything they needed. And so we just kind of had this shadow pool running behind the low latency pool on the exact same resources. And that worked really well. Um, uh, in 04, what we're about to do is basically the same solution, but instead of running two start keys, which is a pain in the neck and sort of administratively confusing, we're doing the same thing by using multiple sets of additional slots on the same machine with separate C group settings. So one Condor start key is managing the same solution, but we basically have two two sets of, of um, partitionable, partitionable slots, both of which think they own the entire machine, and one of which 
uh, will always uh, uh, dominate the resources if it wants it. Um, anyway, like I said, this works well, but it's, it's still kind of janky, right? You, you, you're you're over committing the machine. We have to statically partition the memory between the, the two uh, slots. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it could be better, but it's, it's the best we've done. Um, for high throughput CPU prioritization, the kind of offline or, or all our CPUs, we, our supply and demand is very difficult to predict in LIGO and Virgo and Cargo. We have about, about 3,000 people in the collaboration, but about 500 of them are active data analysis users, working on about 80 different distinct scientific projects, looking for different astrophysical sources, doing different kinds of analyses. Um, and they all have their own independent schedules for when they do development, when they're testing new, new kinds of workflows, when they're simulating, you know, doing mock data challenges in advanced observing runs, uh, and when they're actually doing production science to, you know, for a paper that's got to come out. Um, we've gotten to the point through great pain and, and effort over, over the past, you know, seven or eight years where we have a pretty good projection over three years of what we're going to need, total amount of CPU that all of these, all of these 80 searches are going to need. We're, we're getting very good now at, at estimating our total demand. Problem is we have no idea uh, how it's going to come over the course of those three years. Who's going to need how many CPUs when is... Uh, it can't be predicted because it depends again on the sort of idiosyncratic schedules of development and production and, and of each of these 80, 80 different searches. Um, and so, our, you know, our default solution up until it has always just been the, the sort of standard Condor fair share scheduling by user. Um, but the reason this is hard is that, you know, when uh, resources are, are tight and somebody's got to get something important done, we have to do lots of reactive kind of manual user priority. You know, we, we, we run kind of user prio, we goose an individual user so they get a huge chunk of the pool, uh, and that solves the problem. Um, the pro but, you know, it isn't great because the Unix users don't equal the scientific priorities, right? A project may have seven people working on it, and you don't know which one's the one who submitted the job, so we got to figure that out. One person may actually be working on, you know, two or six or eight of these 80 searches, and so goosing their jobs, that user's job, might actually prioritize two different things you didn't want to prioritize. In practice, it works okay, but it, it's a pain. It's not the it's not the thing we actually want to be tweaking. Um, the users are sort of a poor proxy for what we want to be tweaking. Um, and then, uh, you know, when we're done, we have to undo it. You know, after the paper's out, and we've got to kind of unwind that 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 change. Um, there's some things that Condor has done that's made this much easier for us. The user priority ceiling has been very helpful, which basically puts a cap on how many. Uh, jobs a user can run because that way we can sort of turn the user's priority, you know, up to 11 and not worry about them taking over the whole pool. We can turn up to 11 but cap them at, you know, 40% of the entire cluster or 80% or whatever, whatever we think is a reasonable limit. That kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a crude knob, but it, it works really well. Um, what do we actually want? We don't know. I mean, you know, Marona always asks me to say in English what, you know, what policy we want for prioritization. The truth is we just don't know. Um, what we do know is we want less manual tweaking of knobs that are in practice kind of poor proxies for what we really care about, which is the relative weighting of competing large projects and deadlines on one hand, while avoiding the complete starvation of individual, you know, uh, the little guy on the other hand. Um, and we just want, it would be nice to be able to sort of reason about projects and deadlines rather than, or in addition to Unix users and, and fair share priorities. So I don't know that there's a good solution to this, but this is one of the things that's hard for us. Um, Another thing that's hard, uh, what, I, what I would call grid flocking, you know, multi-grid uh, operations. Um, if you're a LIGO user and you're an IGWIN, uh, IGWIN is an acronym for LIGO, Virgo, and COGRA, sort of writ large. So uh, I apologize, my, my later slides made that clearer. But LIGO, if you're a LIGO user on one of our access points at Caltech, you have access to our, our LIGO, Virgo, COGRA computing grid of resources we manage or have access to. You have a local Condor pool at Caltech, which you can use if the grid's not working right. So you can just go straight to the local pool. Uh, and you can go to the open science pool. Um, but the user experience of doing this um, really kind of sucks. Uh, the command line tools, of course, for all of us who know it, you can say, you know, dash uh, central manager equals blah, blah, blah. You have, you have to know the host name of it, which is often like 40 characters and something that an admin at OSG made up. Um, it can change over time. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 sort of it's not a friendly thing, and and the, the the tools don't actually understand that there's a that users are using multiple tools at a time. You can't run, you can't ask the question, show me all my jobs, regardless of what pool they came from. You've got to run Condor, you know, status dash run three times once for each pool. You've got to, it's 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 painful. Um, 
And it's really bad when you got to debug because different pools have different pilots and the pilots are different environments. And even when you're running in a container, it turns out, you know, the environment variable flow through and into a container can, can uh, affect our jobs and does all the time. And so when, when users are running on different tools, the different pilot environments end up leading to different job behavior. It's, it's sort of mayhem. Um, and users can't even tell where, you know, from which pool they got a resource once they've got it. It's very complicated. Um, so this, this is hard. Um, fourth thing, uh, grid sites. So uh, where's Todd Miller? Raise your hand. Todd, uh, he, he's, he's great and he, oh, every time I mention the word sites in the context of grid, he's like, what do you mean? There's no such thing as a site. And you're right, it's an ill-defined concept, but uh, nonetheless, it is a critically useful one. And it's one which we absolutely must regularly use in practice. Um, so, uh, you know, one working definition, this is not bulletproof, this is not the definition, but what, you know, one definition of what we mean by a site is a set of co-located execution points under common administrative control with a homogeneous runtime environment on which user impacting failures will tend to correlate. So what we mean is a bunch of, you know, starties that are probably all going to go offline and fail together, you know, because that site's offline. Or they will all exhibit the same job dysfunction because they're all configured a certain way. They're all going to have the environment variable messed up in the same way when your job runs. Um, or they're all going to experience a slow data transfer because the LAN is overwhelmed. Um, this is what we mean by a site, and it's it's like you know the old adage of the Supreme Court thing. You know you, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. We all know what a site is, um, but Condor has no concept of sites at all, um, and admins and users need to reason about and act on sites constantly. Um, users often want to target a specific site for all kinds of reasons. They want to test a new site, to make sure it works. They're debugging a job that they've figured out always fails at one site, so they want to run there. Um, they have an allocation at a site. It's it's not easy to do this. There's ways to do it. You can you can construct the right requirements expressions. You can fish around for the right attributes, uh, but it's not durable and it's not easy to do. Um, another thing, it's very difficult for users or in particular access point administrators who also need to do this to just recognize that a whole bunch of jobs or a whole bunch of job failures actually all involve a common site. You can submit ten thousand jobs and you get. 2,000 failures, and it can take you a day to realize, oh, there's actually just two sites that are, that you know, account for all of these errors. But it's very hard to, to just figure that out, um, uh, you know. Uh, but this happens all the time. Um, once you figure this out, you can't easily deny list the site. You can't just say, I, I want to run my jobs everywhere except that site, because the site doesn't really exist. And so you have to kind of figure out how to set requirements expressions to make it work in a way that's often very janky. Um, once you do that, you then have to remember to undo it. And in fact, we constantly in Ligo discover that we're not running on some huge resource that wants us to run there because it was broken six months ago and somebody, you know, managed to get the, the factory configuration to, to block that site for us. And, oh, that's why we haven't been running there for six months. Uh, we, you know, just keeping track of that is, is hard. Um, and finally, often you just want to give credit by site. You know, sites correspond often to organizations that you would like to talk about and give credit to and say, oh, we ran a whole bunch of this at INFN, or we ran a whole bunch of these jobs at on Exceed, you know, and um, it's, uh, it's hard to do that. Finally, uh, the last thing is hard is data, which we all know. Um, uh, there's different kinds of data. So there's what I would call job runtime data. This is, this is you know, uh, files that a job is working on while it's running. Um, these are important for, for inspecting a job, debugging it, monitoring the progress of the job. And, um, our users got very, partly because we gave them uh, a dumb, we did something dumb, which was we gave them shared NFS file systems between our submit nodes and our execute nodes and our local pools. Um, but also because Condor SSH to Java works really well in a local pool, our users got very used to being able to, 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 to check out their jobs while they run, run a job and then look at everything it's doing while it runs. And this just does not work well on the grid. Um, Condor SSH to Java doesn't work all the time. Uh, you, you can't, you know, you don't have the shared file system, et cetera. Um, it doesn't make any sense to just always stream all your temporary files back when you only need to look at one in 100,000 jobs. Uh, it's just, it, in practice, this is kind of a usability regression for our users who are used to running on small local pools. Um, by the way, I should say, these aren't things I necessarily think Condor can fix for us, right? This isn't a, a, you should, you know, fix this bug for us. This is just stuff that's hard, right? Um, job checkpoint data. Used to be Condor's problem to manage. Now it's every user's problem. Um, I miss the days when when users didn't have to worry about schlepping their checkpoint data around. Um, 
job workflow input data, you know, the actual science input data, parameters, configuration. Um, you know, we're used to pushing everything out from the submit code. Uh, that's really easy, but it doesn't scale. Um, CVMFS is really easy, but it, it isn't reliable. Um, the intermediate workflow data, uh, you know, inter-job results. So the output of one job that needs to be the input of another, but you throw it away when the workflow is done. Um, you know, the state of the art in LIGO is that comes back and forth to the submit node, which is a dozen scale. Um, workflow output data, you know, the state of the art in LIGO is when you schlep that back to the submit node. That doesn't scale. Um, that's our that's our problem. But um, and in the future, one of the things, another kind of data we really want is what I would call runtime telemetry, which is we want jobs to be um, in science terms uh, updating something about their progress. You know, oh, I did another event. I did another event. And this is important for our optimization and performance monitoring. We really need to know sort of in practice in the real world, what's the rate of, of you know, event processing we're seeing by site, for example, or you know, for a given version of a code base, et cetera. This is all data to manage, and it's really hard to manage all these kinds of data. Um, you know, what are the right storage elements and authentication and transfer protocols for third-party transfer? So we can move away from kind of the access point, execution point, direct data transfer. Um, I don't know. Um, it was 20 years ago this month or, or a week that uh, the Condor Nest paper came out, um, and we still don't have you know distributed high throughput computing storage, discovery, authentication, authorization, allocation, quality of service, timeout, cleanup. The way we you know we have all these things we take for granted with CPU cores that we don't have for storage. Um, there's lots of promising building blocks, um, but you know what, can we pull them together is the question. So um, that's it. That's my rant. Um, discussion. People have. Is anyone else having these problems? Anyone have solutions? I throw it out there. So, Lauren Michael here from CHTC. I will say, for a lot of things you said, Amen. But especially about sites, and as a facilitator of researchers using the Open Science Pool, Amen. <laughs> So, That's great. And uh, unfortunately, I can only solve one bullet point. Uh, Sorry? Which I, I, I can only solve one bullet point. Uh, so, so one thing that we did in CMS that was really useful was uh, chirp back uh, application performance statistics uh, back to the, the schedules that then just everybody got sucked up into the various uh, uh, metrics collection. And I, I think that worked wonderfully. It, it, you know, we it, it was a just a channel that that was fairly reliable. Uh, that you know, I, I can't recommend more for those runtime telemetry type stuff. Uh, Chirp is a is a phenomenal tool, and it, and it will work at the scale. Um, I don't have any other solutions, but uh, on the idea of uh, grid sites, one thing uh, I, I don't like it because it says grid. Uh, and I don't like it because it says sites. Uh, so one of the <laughs> one of the things I've been uh, tinkering with is we should not try to define these things, but talk about failure domains and and talk about places where we can expect failure to be correlated because we seem to have a better understanding of of that than what a, a site is. And and we if you talk about failure domains, I also feel like you you're you're less likely to say a, a single execution point is in only one. We, we, have, we want to say this EP is at that site and the world is pretty murky. When we talk about failure domains, it seems somehow natural to say these things can be correlated. So uh, immediately after that uh, discussion uh, that Peter was referring to where uh, I had went on my little rant about what does a site really mean? Uh, I talked this over or, you know, ranted a little bit at it with a coworker who had a brilliant suggestion that, you know, or observation that something like 80% of the time what we're really talking about is file transfer problems. Uh, and that what we should do is try uh, to characterize EPs, not by this idea of a site, because if administrators really wanted to do it, they could have done it already, right? They can put whatever they want in the machine ad, and none of them do. Uh, what we should do is ask people who really know about what they need to know about the file transfer infrastructure to write a little script that runs on all of these EPs and advertises those attributes. And then we can characterize all of these sites by those attributes. And if we need to, we can put them together in a hash and we can say, based on having identical hashes, these machines should perform the same way, whether or not the administrator thinks that's true. 
We can expand this a little bit and we can hash things like the uh, config file that the beam was operating on, throw that in too. Uh, frequently, it seems to me like a lot of these problems are also caused by the administrators thinking that the config is one thing, when in fact, for some reason or another, it's, it's something completely different. Uh, and so I really like this idea. It's kind of a return to the, uh, the concept that the start these should advertise things that matter to people in terms of matchmaking. And we don't know what the site is. We don't know how to define it. We don't. We can't get people to actually tell us what it is. Nobody's willing to do that because they haven't yet. It's been 25 years. Uh, and so I think the more we can automate this and be very specific about the things that actually matter, the better off we are. And maybe we should kind of, as, as Brian was suggesting, concentrate on a particular failure domain uh, and try and automate that. So you, you can do a matchmaking that won't blow up auto clusters on something like this is a hash of the configuration that we know just won't work. Uh, <clears throat> Peter, thank you for the 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 list, and uh, I definitely uh, definitely plan on sharing it with some of our friends inside uh, the Beltway. But uh, so one uh, comment is. Uh, can you rank it? If I come to you today, Peter, and say, I can work on one thing. Uh, uh, is that a sorted list? No. Uh, uh, is that, uh, so, so what, uh, you know, we, we have uh, a limited amount of, uh, I, I prefer to call it talent, not effort, because People think that when we talk about effort, it's, we want more money. What should we tackle first? And then I can tell you uh, this, uh, if we start working on it today, maybe, uh, what did we hear this morning? In 2035, they will have uh, the antennas. So when they have the antennas, you will have the software. Or do you want something in the next six months? Or do you want a little bit? Or you want a lot? Because uh, a lot what is on this list uh, are a hard problem. And uh, you know, in, in computer science, we label things as uh, uh, hard and NP-hard and uh, all the kind of thing. So, uh, where should we start, and what are the kind of steps that we can take to deliver something that you will say you you helped LIGO to to do scientific discovery? I think that's the challenge. Now, going back to the problem of of scheduling. If you don't know what you want, then uh, yes, you, it's like uh, uh, I, I, I want to have a better steering wheel, but I have no clue where I want to take the car. So it doesn't matter what the steering wheel does. So uh, a lot of what's happening with computing in the science is that you really don't know what you want to accomplish. When is it good? All you know is that people are showing up at your door every morning and scream that they cannot do their science. <clears throat> but you don't even know how much they need here, how much they need there. So can we make some progress without knowing, or is there an abstraction that we can provide you that will make your life somewhat easy. By the way, the, the, what you are talking about sites is uh, something that is on our radar. Now we started by talking about sets of jobs. And what you are asking us to do is to define sets of regions to make it the first class but uh, I don't know, Todd, what is it now? Two years that we started to talk about a set of jobs, at least. So while we are keeping 
the the the, the bird flying, we we are making progress on on set of dog. Now you may argue that we made a mistake and we should not start with set of jobs, but we should start with set of, of size. Uh, maybe, I, I, I'm, uh, but at least we have done something on set of, of jobs, which hopefully can help you in some of the, of the allocation that you talked about, especially in HPC. So, uh, so the next step for you, or uh, pull together committee, give me the top five. We have a question from Calvin. We're going to ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Uh, I had two kind of separate comments. Uh, actually, the first was on your second point, uh, two out of five. Um, I believe we have a, a similar, we ran into kind of a similar issue here. And what we do for this one is we use accounting groups on top of the fair share. Um, which makes shuffling around resources uh, a lot cleaner in cases where someone wants to go ahead. Um, in particular, we have a high priority share that people are not allowed to submit to um, by default, but that is forced to always sort ahead of everything else. And then you can then move the jobs there and then you don't have to change anything back after the fact. It will just automatically run those first and then doesn't change any default submits afterwards. So that was, I know you asked if anyone else ran this type of stuff. This was something that we did to, to address it. Um, and then second, I wanted to echo a point for one out of five, uh, the need for, uh, I believe what you called the online submits for jobs that needed to run immediately. Uh, this was another thing that we ran into and uh, it got to the point where we measured if you do a, a DAG submit, um, there is some overhead in sending stuff to the SCED and creating the Condor Dagman and then the time so that and then waiting for the negotiation cycle. So the time from when somebody actually submitted the job to when the job picked up was an average of like around 90 seconds or something. And, and we determined that was too long. So um, we we looked for other solutions and uh, I, I don't want to recommend what we did because it is a, a deprecated feature, but uh, I wanted to echo the need for some form of, hey, we have this job ad and we have a list we know what our, what our potential machines are and we want to run this job on this machine right now and just skip the entire schedule uh, scheduling process. And I know that that kind of ruins what a scheduler is doing. Uh, I understand that. Uh, but for very specific things where it's kind of a... Um, uh, we need this right away, and we don't care that it, it's uh, it's throwing a wrench in the works for how everything else is being scheduled. And we have permissions to run this on this host and all sorts of other qualifications. Uh, but just something like that would be would be a very nice feature to have. Hey, Peter, that was a that was a fantastic uh, talk and list. Uh, thank you for for pulling all this together. Um, so Colin is, as usual, one step ahead of me. So I was going to ask the, the, the same thing. Um, you know, I, I could speculate what, what, what the problems were, but I was curious if you tried, you know, group accounting, you know, to, to you know, a user isn't a, isn't a project, you know, I was wondering what, what about group accounting uh, tripped up LIGO? And for Colin, I, I don't know if you tried using the Condor Now mechanism, the Condor Now tool or, or or not, but that's we're aware of, of what you know what Colin was was talking about. We're we're trying to address it with the, the Condor now tool. Uh, we have a question from Douglas. Douglas, we're going to ask you to unmute. So my my question comes from something that. We had to do it. It sort of follows on with the HEP cloud last thing, but 
Now that in experimental particle physics, we're standardizing on certain toolkits, and it's not all Condor, um, but Condor is a critical part of some of it. The real question is, can we go to sites are a construct that exists because they're because data centers are independent, right? There is some federation that's going on, but we're being forced more and more, at least in the DOE side, to start using more and more of their big machine because they bought it, they'd like you to use it. And there seems to be a mismatch there. And this is where some help from the Condor team so that the various work, workload scheduling systems we use can plug in because not everything is glide in WMS. I won't say the five letter word that usually gets Marone excited. But I guess my point is, as, sci we're, as groups who are supposed to support the scientists doing the science, we have to bring resource, make resources available to them. And it's getting increasingly heterogeneous. Yet the number of people to, to do the support isn't growing. So I think we have to figure out some way of increased collaboration. Right. How, how, do we, how do we make progress? So how are we as a community or what have you make progress on it to, to make uh, your life easier? Uh, I, and, you know, there, there, there are several moving pieces here. And uh, yes, it is frustrating that uh, we had the work on Ash 20 years ago, but uh, without hurting the feeling of anyone, there were all these geniuses that came and said, Dcash is the solution. And where's Dcash? Another road kill. But uh, when you come and, and you, you have around you uh, <laughs> strong forces that by whatever reason can then, it, we we cannot make make progress. So we finally, Brian and I, got now an award to to start dealing with storage allocation. You know, in all this, you didn't talk about, uh, or you have it somewhere buried, uh, that uh, we we cannot do anything about storage. So uh, hopefully, we'll make some uh, small contribution there, but. Yes, we need guidance on on priorities because otherwise we do what we think is is good from the computer science side, and that obviously is not likely to be the solution. But uh, it it's great, and and it, that's the objective of this meeting is to talk about what we don't know how to do, not how wonderful we are. So as, as Todd said, this, it's great that you put it together, but we cannot walk away from it because otherwise you'll come back in, in 20 years and uh, say the same thing, reuse your slides. All right, I'd like to thank Peter Carvaris for posing some very hard problems for us.